What happens if you go plant-based? Is it healthier? Is it truly better for your heart or for your risk of cancer? Or will it be making it impossible for you to get in all the protein that you need that is rich in essential amino acids for your muscle? Do you dance that dance? Are you on the fence? Are you not sure which way to go? Well, this episode is just for you. Considering pros and cons, opening up the conversation that for some can be a little bit sensitive. And I've got the perfect guest ahead. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, but most of all, hope to inspire you. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset, often about what you eat and how to move, so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in the second and better half. Let's do this. My guests today, and yes, that was plural, are Maria Claps and Kristen Johnson. Maria is an FDN, which is Functional Diagnostic Nutritionist Practitioner, and Kristen, a board-certified nutritionist, are plain-spoken friends and practitioners who share a passion for women's health, especially women's health, at midlife, as both are themselves menopausal. They've refined the art and science of thriving at as midlife women based on both clinical and personal experience. They combine individualized nutrition and lifestyle changes tailored to midlife women's needs with mindset coaching, lab testing, and hormone replacement therapy education to help women thrive so they can stop or prevent their health from spinning out of control. Ladies, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure for having us. All right, we are going to dive right into this, and we are unpacking, listeners, a topic of conversation that needs some clarity, needs some attention, and may be sensitive and touchy with some of you, but we three think that it deserves some attention, and what we're doing is pointing out the facts. We're not necessarily taking sides, or if we are, we're taking your side, so that's where we come from today. So... Let's first, ladies, just kind of go really foundational for everybody who's listening, who I hope is walking, lifting, and or if you have a job and jobs are dumb, you're commuting, all right? So they're out there, and let's just paint the picture clearly of what happens to women's metabolism in midlife. Well, we lose muscle, um, and we decline in our hormones, I should probably have said that. So we lose muscle and decline in our hormones, and that just creates a, a whole host of metabolic problems. It's it's the it is the hormone changes of midlife. So it's not the menstrual cycle; it's the hormone changes of midlife that make the metabolic changes in the body and the physiological changes so profound. So knowing that that's going under the hood, I mean, we know that, and Tell the women listening how they know their metabolism is changing. Yeah, I mean, we see it in the first shifting of weight uh, from around our thighs and rear end to sort of our belly and our midsection. Um, Women who've had flat tummies all their lives can in midlife suddenly not have a flat tummy. And That's kind of your first sign. We see it in decreased performance in the gym. Muscle mass loss is starting to increase. Um, It's difficult to put it on as well as to keep it. Um, We can see mood changes, cognition, just general energy, fatigue, malaise. And the metabolic piece becomes compounded because as women, we start to chase our image, right? We start to chase how we want to look. And the old method that seems to always be the fallback is to start to cut calories and exercise more and more and more. And all of that does is increases our stress physiologically, which adds cortisol into the equation. And now we end up really increasing that belly fat. And it just becomes a very vicious cycle for women. And, you know, it is largely driven by these changes in the hormones that are going on. But that doesn't mean it's out of your control. You have to just know what levers to pull. You know, and unfortunately, we just keep pulling the wrong one over and over again, and women get exasperated, understandably, and give up. So that's what we want to change. 
that is somewhere in there is the definition of insanity, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're not getting good results with this, so I'm definitely turning it up. I'm going to do more of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think I imagine women out there, as you were talking, saying, check. Yeah, got that. Check. Got that. Check. Got that. And and all understanding completely what you're talking about. And I imagine that many of the women out there are like, are you kidding? I don't need them to define what's happening to my metabolism. <laughs> I totally got this one. All right. But here's the good side of things. I mean, what can they do about it? I mean, we, we can take control. I just think that we, we can't do the things we did that worked for us at 20 and 30. I can't tell you how many women, uh, they, they think that like they, you said, Deb, that they have to turn it up, that they have to work harder. Right. And we can't do that anymore because our bodies are fundamentally changing. So the the good thing is, you know, yeah. Can absolutely do stuff. I'm yeah. going to, can I just interject here? I want to ask you, just the both of you, each honestly, you know, what worked at 20 and 30? And I sometimes wonder, did that really work or could we just get away with it? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. We think about that all the time that it's, you know, your, your sort of health savings bank was more robust in your 20s and 30s. Mm-hmm. We hadn't yeah. had life deplete that balance. So, we were getting away with it ostensibly on the surface, but our body was taking the hit internally. And we tell women all the time, look, your body is your body. It is trying to support you all the time. When it stops being able to keep up with your not so great choices is usually around midlife. That doesn't mean it's rebelling against you. It just means you've kind of depleted the balance and now you're in a hole. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I agree with you. I don't think that we really got away with it it just had a delayed, you know, payback. Right. I I have a moment of, I I, I totally agree, Kristen, but I do have an example of where I think something that worked for me, maybe perhaps more than got away with it. And I'm going to bring out the whole bowl of oatmeal now. (laughs) Um, I was a, you know, I was able to eat oatmeal uh, probably up until about age 35. A couple of walnuts, cinnamon, little bit of maple syrup, you know, I'm not, don't have a super sweet, uh, tastes. So I didn't drown it in toppings like sweet stuff and fruit. And I mean, I felt great. It kept me, kept me satiated. You know, I, I see my six foot two, like three and a half percent body fat sons eating that way. And they're like, mom, why don't you ever eat oatmeal anymore? I'm like, I, I can't because it's just, it's not, it doesn't fit my midlife nutrition template. So I do think I was able to eat that. And then, you know, I had to come to the realization that's just not serving me anymore in so many ways. So. Yeah. I think we've talked about that with clients. We call it the, uh, the trifecta of caffeine, carbohydrates, and cortisol, right? And, you know, what Maria just said is an example of when we are younger, we do have more robust amounts of estrogen in our system. And estrogen helps us metabolize and handle carbohydrate load. Now, I would probably push back on Maria a little bit out of love and say, if you were wearing a CGM and we were looking at your blood sugar down those times, we might beg to differ and that it was really serving you with that oatmeal. But in all seriousness, in your 20s and 30s, you do have a greater capacity for carbohydrates. And so things that worked then uh, aren't going to work now. And, you know, we can argue over whether or not metabolically on a blood serum level, they were even working at that time, but that's neither here nor there. The reality is with low estrogen, you just can't handle carbs the way you used to. And that was such a great statement right there. And I don't think that's ever been said out loud on this show. So that was a, that's one that'll sit, I think with listeners for a while. And another reason to respect that, estrogen levels dropping is a reason to change your strategy, right? Because I'm sure you hear this all the time too. What I used to do doesn't work anymore. And I'm like, but you don't have the same hormones you had anymore. Why would it work anymore? Right? And, I and, and I say that to you listeners, not condescending, but I think we do have to laugh about it because the alternative is we're crying. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think, can, I, can I add something into that discussion? Please. Um, so even if we are women that are using hormone replacement therapy, uh, we'll just say progesterone and estrogen because that's where most women start, um, or most women start with progesterone, sometimes then add estrogen or they start with testosterone. But even if you're adding in HRT, 
right? We don't have to qualify. You still can't eat that way. Like in other words, so we said that there's like, there's a real metabolic decline with loss of estrogen. Um, it's like, it's a metabolic hormone for us. So many of us think of it as a sex hormone, breast, you know, babies, breastfeeding, hips, things like that, but it's a metabolic hormone. So when we lose it, we already went over that. We add it back in all good. No, Mm -mm. better, (laughs) better, but still have to, you know, stick to a nutrition template that serves your midlife women's needs. And that's because your replacement, as as much as we are fans, generalized fans of HRT, it's never going to approximate what your ovaries did for yeah. you. Yeah. You know, and I feel like right now, can we just take a moment of silence for the carbs in our life? <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Now that we've done that. All right. So I feel like we're tiptoeing around it, but we yeah. got it there. Right. So Maria, I have to ask. What do you have for breakfast now? Oh, um, usually steak or salmon. Um, eggs kind of bore me, although they kind of fit the nutrition template, but they bore me. They don't quite fill me up as much unless I load them up with cheese and that's, you know, nice sharp cheddar and that's debatable as to whether that's a good thing for me. So <laughs> I indulge every now and then in cheese, but, you know, usually eggs I'm sorry, steak, salmon. I usually have a little bit of, you maybe like a little few side pieces of broccoli. Sometimes I'll have sauteed cabbage with bacon. Um, you like your ferments? I like my ferments, just a tablespoon, a couple days a week. Um, but usually a solid piece of animal protein. And just trying to think, very rarely a properly made protein drink smoothie. Um, I like to chew in the morning, mm-hmm. you know, we will do smoothies, but sometimes we'll do them like later in the day or, you know, as a means to kind of get up to the amount of protein we like to get. Because truth be told, you know, the amount of protein that Kristen and I tend to aim for on a daily basis can be hard to choose sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kristen, do you want to share what you, just, I think it would be good. Listeners would love it if you'd share sure. what you have for our breakfast. Sure. I will um, often choose whatever we had for dinner the night before. So I usually am the one stealing the leftovers before the husband gets them for lunch. Um, The other day that was, you know, kind of a very meat heavy base sloppy joe that I had with like some mushrooms and pickles chopped up in it. Um, So I'll just eat that meat. Um, Burgers and bacon are kind of my go-to. I love them. And um, in fact, last year for my birthday, Maria sent me a entire case of um, heritage uh, artisanal bacon, if that tells you how much I love bacon. Um, I also love Arctic char is one of my favorites. And like Maria said, eggs just don't fill me up. They're just not satiating. And I don't mean fill from like fill my stomach, but more just fill my energy stores to start the day. So if I do do eggs, it's usually with about a half pound of sausage, chorizo, you know, other meats, maybe some pancetta thrown in and a little bit of raw cheese. So that's a typical morning for me. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Great concept. And so I feel like I, um, it's by default I should share as well. So I was a smoothie for breakfast girl for a really long time and I'm shifting it. So I'm just finding, I think intuitively that having leftovers actually serves me better. And whether it's leftover, um, I love, bison. So, you know, burgers or ground meat, either one, um, that's a staple in here or chicken, definitely salmon. If it's in there, that's going to go first. So, you know, I don't always, I will do a smoothie still, but I'm finding, I just feel better. It's seeming to work for me better. So I think listening and testing, if you're out there and you're just thinking this is totally new, I tell my audience this, we're the only country in the world that has quote unquote breakfast foods, all of which were bad for us, really, right? Sugary. I grew up with tiger, Tony the Tiger Frosted Flakes and, you know, all those other things. But um, those days are gone. I think we all get that. But even some of the healthier oatmeal options really are not probably serving like you think they are. So Let's talk about the animal protein connection. And neither of you said, you know, I I tend to sit down to, you know, a bowl of legumes or beans and rice. So let's get specific. I mean, that is a lot of carbohydrates. And is that a part of the reason why 
even though that would be a complete protein, that's not necessarily going to work. So yeah. for, for me, it's primarily like it's, it's the carbohydrate load. I still, you know, I still do, Kristen Lesso, eat some carbohydrates and enough, I think, that serves me well, that keeps my weight in line. So for, for me, it's, it's almost purely based on it's just too much carbohydrate. It's going to spike my blood sugar. It's going to, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, unfortunately, I think I'm a little bit, I, I'm sensitive to that. I, I can see my insulin start to rise if I eat too many carbohydrates. So for me, that's really pretty much all it is. Kristen has a little bit more of a nuanced take on, on why she avoids that. And I'll let you share. Yeah. yeah. So, so I um, definitely did that, you know, late thirties, early forties mistake of the seeing the weight change and doing the deprivation, deprivation, extra spinach salads and more workouts. Right. And um, I knew that I had a gluten issue. I didn't realize how severe it was until I tested it. And so when you start taking out those breakfast foods that we as Americans tend to love, um, I was left with, you know, the almond flour pancakes and, um, you know, the banana breads and the smoothies with the nut butters and all of those sorts of things, or the big sam um, spinach with you know, a can of wild salmon on it or something like that. Um, the problem for me is that I was a very competitive athlete. I was a national level uh, competitive rower, um, sometimes twice a day, five days a week. So super, super active. My caloric needs were pretty high. And I continued to follow this very plant heavy template in that workout sort of caloric ex, um, expenditure model. And what I ended up doing was essentially overdosing myself on plants. And for me, it turned into a massive anti-nutrient problem with oxalates in particular. So I ended up with 24 bilateral kidney stones, no kidney disease history in my family, never had an issue before. Um, it took a lot of you know, trial and error before they finally got it diagnosed. Um, they thought I had recurrent UTIs, you know, then they thought I had um, cystitis issue, all of these things. And I didn't know who would have ever thought that plants could be providing you with anti-nutrients, right? I was also starting to show significant mineral deficiencies. Knowing now what I know, that's not a shock, right? There are anti-nutrients in, in plants that bind up your minerals and make them unavailable to you. You know, we like to say spinach is super high in iron. It is if we test it in a lab. It's not an iron that you actually get in your belly, right? So I ended up just really double whammying myself with insufficient amino acids to support my physical activity and then an anti-nutrient load that was legitimately making me very, very ill. Um, I thought I had RA, I was looking, you know, do I have Lyme's disease? Just all of these different issues. Meanwhile, having three spinach salads a day and almond flour this and cassava <sighs> flour that. So once I realized, wow, this is creating a wild storm of inflammation, it's defeating all of my performance goals, and I started to dial it back, I realized I had really made myself so sick that I had to cut plants out entirely. So I know that gets a lot of people freaked out. They think it's really trendy, this sort of all meat-based nutrition template and carnivore. You know, Marie and I see it as a very available, targeted, therapeutic option for people who are sick. And for me, that was the case. I had Clostridium difficile in my gut, like just all sorts of things. So I did go to an all meat nutrition template for a long time. I've gone back to cabbage, arugula, things like that, that help with digestion, um, you know, in season berries and fruits, who doesn't love a good farmer's market, you know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, the plant proteins, I learned they're a myth. I mean, they just aren't a protein. You know, everything has protein in it almost. It's, mm -hmm. we call foods by the thing that they are the most, right? So anyone who's calling a lentil protein is absolutely delusional. There's protein in a lentil, but it's not what the lentil is primarily providing you. And that's where I started to realize I was not eating enough protein. The most bioavailable form of it is animal protein. And once I switched, my health literally turned on a dime within weeks. So, you know, we're pretty passionate about the need for animal protein. And, you know, we just ended a conversation talking about cutting carbs and this is something we hear all the time from when I tried low carb, it didn't work for me. And, you know, your listeners, Deb, are active women. If you just cut carbs, it's not going to work. You have to replace them with something. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you replace them with protein because in our 50s, 
and the workouts that you're, you know, having these women do, they need to have building blocks to actually make the muscle that we're looking for. So that, that was a big aha moment. I think for both Marie and me was it's not just about cutting the carbs. It's about replacing them with the thing that's right. And for us, that's animal protein. So let's just back up one second, talk a little bit about oxalates, because I think there may be listeners who are like, okay, no, I've heard that before. I'm not quite sure what that is. Do you want to break that down just a little bit and speak to, you mentioned you're, you're coming back, so you're doing cabbages, you're doing arugula, but certainly not indulging in spinach now. Nope. No, no, so, spinach, no almond products. Yeah. So, so plants have, you know, people don't like this term anti-nutrients because Um, We like to think that plants sort of have a health halo on them. And if we say they have anti-anything, then we're just anti-plant. That's not the case. It's just the reality that, you know, plants have a biological defense mechanism to not be eaten in the wild. And those involve different things, whether they're tannins or lectins or phytic acid or things like oxalates. These are all just compounds, molecular compounds within plants that are there to allow them to grow freely in the wild. Now, we have bastardized a lot of plants by growing them and injecting them with things to make our, you know, bounty more bountiful and that sort of stuff. So, you know, plants today don't even resemble plants from the wild to begin with, um, but they still contain all those anti-nutrients. And those anti-nutrients, like I said, they can bind up minerals and vitamins, make things less available to you. Oxalates are an interesting thing. They're kind of a crystal. They start to settle into our tissues. So a lot of women who are doing a super like spinach plant-based diet will say they have a lot of joint problems, right? And they think that these joint problems are related to either over-exercising, exercising wrong, or old injuries. And Marie and I like to say, well, A, it's probably partly your loss of estrogen, <laughs> and which makes your tissues a little brittle. But B, if you're really overdosing, so to speak, on these plants, you may be kind of lining some of your joints with these oxalate crystals, and it's painful, you know, it's it's um, interstitial cystitis is almost exclusively caused by a too high of an oxalate load in a woman's diet. So, you know, these are things that we just want to make sure women understand. Plants aren't in themselves bad. It's, you know, the volume of plants that we tend to consume in the quest for a whole food plant based diet that tends to be the, come the problem. So good. And Maria, I want to come back to you because I know that you teased this a little bit and I I didn't pull it out at the time, but when you said sometimes I'll do a smoothie like in the midday to try to get in and up the quota of protein and reach what my goals are. So probably we should talk a little bit about, you know, target for goals. But I think also if we've got listeners who are maybe they need to hear this seven or more times and we're only number three, you know, so they're not quite ready to change yet. And they're still wanting to do plant-based protein. And maybe because a doctor advocated that this is for your heart health is what I want you to do. And, and there's some buy-in to that. What's your thought on taking supplements, amino acid supplements, powder or tablet form to get you the rest of the distance? I'm not really a fan of that, but my reason why is a little bit more philosophical. I think Kristen can probably speak from it to it from a more clinical perspective, but I'm not a fan because I really feel like we need to chew our food to kind of register the, so like the brain has to register that you have satiety, right? So chewing helps with that, but also <clears throat> this, this is why. And again, more philosophical. You really couldn't be a vegan a um, hundred years ago. You didn't have, or we'll say two hundred or three hundred, right? We didn't have the B twelve. We didn't have, you know, the amino acid supplements. So, I think veganism is truly like a, a big disconnect from nature and from what we are supposed to. And it, and quite frankly, it's 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 so many. I will say young city dwellers disconnected from really what, you know, natural evolution is. And I'm just, yeah, so I'm just not a fan. Kristen and I, we, we use supplements, right? And we do see some people, even mm-hmm. meat eaters that need B12 sometimes. And, um, you know, we use all manner of supplements on an as needed basis. We try to try to be minimalists when it comes to that. We really try to focus on lifestyle and mindset, 
Um, but let's be for real. If you have like, if you have a need, you have a need, but we don't believe in overriding nature, overriding the obvious. And the obvious is, you know, you have incisor teeth, uh, your, your ancestors, (laughs) ancestors were not vegan. (laughs) That's such a great point. Really, really great point. Interesting. I think that's just worth sitting with. That's potentially a mic drop moment it's a, it's here. It's a privilege. Yeah. <laughs> it's a modern day privilege to be vegan. In you know, if we're talking, your listeners maybe are mostly based in the U.S. You have every little greens powder and and this supplement and you know just like everything you could want we live in such a plentiful time and there's so many entrepreneurs and we've got like the we've got the plant-based you know the pea protein entrepreneurs and all these fake foods that's a privilege not a privilege i want any part of but the point of the matter is you can because of technology because of because we, how we progressed, not that that's, again, not necessarily a good thing, but it's there for you. And it allows you to do that, again, not healthfully, but, you know, you live 500 years ago, you weren't vegan. Yeah. Truth. Yeah, yeah, truth. Thank you, got him in. Okay. Um, talk, let's talk a little bit about targets, like amount of protein. And this is not a new subject for our listeners, but again, I think that the the numbers and the goals that we've talked about on this show with prior guests and myself, you know, for you, if you're listening and that was just a, a big leap, it was maybe just a, you needed to hear it that time and you may need to hear it again this time. And so let's just open up the door so you can potentially, maybe you're closing the gap. You're not quite there yet, but what do, what do you all recommend for someone, you know, who's, 130 and 55 pounds. I mean, as far as she's moderately active, meaning she would love to be, but she has a sedentary job like the rest of us in the free world do. (laughs) Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have the government's recommended dietary guidelines, and then we have what's optimal. And, you know, anyone who (laughs) says that the government says X, um, we would say, sure, but that's essentially to just ensure that you're not sick and dying in a bed. That's not necessarily optimal. And, and particularly for midlife women, optimal starts to play into our need to maintain our muscle mass. It protects our bones. It keeps our metabolism going. It prevents frailty. You know, all of the things that we're all honestly scared of, all of us in aging, come down to needing that muscle. As, you know, a wonderful lady, Gabby Lyons, likes to say, muscle is the organ of longevity. And so if that, if we can all just agree on that piece, then it becomes what do we need to maintain that muscle mass or even make more of it, right? And that comes down to meeting a threshold of a particular amino acid called leucine. You need roughly 30 grams of animal protein to meet what's called the leucine threshold, which triggers muscle protein synthesis. Now that's 30 grams of protein at each meal. Okay. And when we look at women's food journals, we will sometimes see 30 grams of protein, maybe at dinner. Um, They eat in sort of this imbalanced little bit for breakfast or none, and then a little bit for lunch and then the bulk of it at dinner. The problem with that is the protein that you're eating earlier in the day is not serving that goal of muscle protein synthesis. So if we're talking about 30 grams minimum per meal, you know, then we're really talking about a hundred grams sort of minimum in a day. But the best advice is 0.8 grams to 1.2 grams per pound of desired body weight. So if you're a 155 pound woman and you want to be 130 pounds, we'd say your target's 130 grams of of um, animal protein. And, um, you know, that can be hard for women to meet, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, we we recognize that's a huge ask. And, and our, our first step is just just aim for that 30 grams of, of meat per meal, um, support your digestion. A lot of women will talk about, I just can't, I can't do that. It doesn't feel good. We hear you. It probably doesn't. Your stomach acids in decline because of your age, your, your gastric secretions are in decline because of your lower estrogen. And 
digestion's a use it or lose it proposition. If you haven't been eating a lot of animal protein, you're not going to have that same capacity to digest it like you did when you were younger. So start slow, you know, add um, broth, broth based soups, put some ground meat in a broth based soup and eat it that way. Um, eggs are a great and easy, simple way to get that protein, but start to layer things, you know, I mean, you don't have to have a half a pound of beef at a meal, you could have a third pound hamburger and four shrimp. You know, there's ways to kind of do this, but it's really just being mindful about hitting those number targets. And for Maria and me, frequently it means three meals and maybe what we refer to as a bridge, which would be like a protein shake at three in the afternoon. Um, That's a really easy way to get your 140 grams of protein that we like to get and not feel like you're eating volumes of food that are going to make you never get off the couch sort of thing. So you know, that that's sort of the target that we like to aim for. Keep it really simple. One gram per pound of desired body weight. Um, but, you know, supporting digestion, layering your proteins, um, you know, those are sort of strategies that we'll teach women to sort of ease their way into that animal protein goal. And, and we'll be honest, most of them will say, oh, this was so much harder than I thought. And then once they get there, they're like, my brain is on fire. I'm, you know, completing 36 hours of work in a 24 hour day, you know, it's just, it's truly life changing, but we recognize it takes some adjustment. Yeah. So glad. And you unpacked a lot there. So I just want to emphasize to listeners. So one of the things I think you said indirectly was this is one of those examples where like one and one or a half is is not going to equal four. I mean, it, it's not like your quota at the end of the day is all that matters. You still have this at a meal threshold. You've got to hit those. And if you miss those benchmarks, it's like a triathlon. They're pulling you out of the water. They're pulling you off the bike. Your day is done. I mean, and it didn't count the way it could. Yeah. Truly, you get to the next meal, you got another chance for a year where protein is concerned, but you really need that per meal threshold. So I love that. But, okay, Maria, I'm going to come over to you because this, um, Kristen opened up a can of worms. She didn't know it, but I'm sure you know what may be coming. A lot of women will be like three meals and at three, I can't fit all those meals in because I'm intermittent fasting. (laughs) Uh, I kind of thought you might have that reaction. (laughs) Um, I would have to ask if, is intermittent fasting really working for them? Like, do they have energy? Are they getting, you know, the weight loss, fat loss that they want? I mean, we let's start from the foundation. We think like everybody should be fasting at least 12 hours between your dinner and your next, you know, your, your first meal of the next day. That's kind of like a basic, right? We've all been, you know, we all have been kind of conditioned to be eating all the time, you know. We actually heard of someone who teaches women, you know, if they stay up late to have another snack before bed. (sighs) Anyway, um, (laughs) to intermittent fasting, I mean, I don't know that the research shows that it's really beyond, say, like 14 hours, really that helpful for women. So um, it actually shows the opposite. There's some great studies who've been coming out in the last few months that are showing that once we start going past that 16, 18 hour mark, It does not matter what you're eating. You are losing lean muscle mass. That's just going to be the fuel that partitions, you know, your body partitions. And, you know, I I get it. There's, we want tighter skin. We want all the things that people say that fasting can promise you, um, but not at the expense of muscle, period, dot. And if you can intermittent fast on like a 16, eight sort of template and still get 130, 140 grams of protein in, yay you, as long as you're not just drinking it down right? We still want to get that satiety that comes from actually eating food, the fats that come with eating real food. So, you know, we're not huge fans of extended fasts. We do think from a digestive and cellular restoration standpoint, 12, 14 hours is a great spot to fall. But, you know, we're just not going to sugarcoat it for ladies. You are losing lean muscle mass when you are yeah. fasting beyond that. Yeah. You know, and I, I echo really what you're saying with that, especially for those women who are more active and loving that and wanting to exercise to burn off the fat and seemingly think that if they exercise fasted the next morning, that'll be even better. And and not realizing all of that time in a fasted state is already, 
increasing cortisol, breaking down muscle, and exercising in a fasted state, exercise period is breaking down muscle. Right. And you know, and then you're a woman. So hello. <laughs> well, we're in for well, trouble. I don't know if you saw Deborah, but Dr. Stacey Sims just came out with some research that said that like layering um fasting on what was it, Kristen? Fasting on top plus, of exercise. On exercise. Top of exercise is, is is actually doing more harm than good. Yeah. yeah. It's very yeah. catabolic. Yeah, and totally get it. And I think you've got to listen. Um, listeners, this is for you, really, if you are a, a very active woman, I used to say this in, um, I know intermittent fasting is not necessarily the same, but I used to tell people just, you cannot be anorexic and an athlete, choose one, which are you? I mean, you know, we you can't play this game. So love that we touched on that. And then I want to touch on something else that you mentioned, because I find this, and I'm wondering if you do too, and you, when you begin working with women, I find a lot of women are intermittent fasting because it helps them avoid eating and they're not comfortable. They have gut issues going on, but they're not resolving those issues. They're just avoiding them by not eating. Finding that. Yeah. I, yeah, we do. It's- and and what would you be your suggestion to a woman who who might be listening who is like, oh, I think I'm busted, you know, but I don't know what to do because this is the only thing that has been helping me get through the day. Where do I begin? I think it's um, a couple things we need to qualify is how symptomatic are you? Because there are certain things that can cause digestive upset that if we sort of approach them with the traditional stomach acid digestive enzymes, we can actually end up doing more harm than good. So that would be know whether or not you have H. pylori, things like that, that may be a bacteria in your stomach that's causing this bloating and belching and, you know, the things that are really uncomfortable. If it's not that acute, you're most likely a candidate to start using some supportive aids. So digestive enzymes that have a full complement of, of, you know, the lipases, proteases, et cetera. Um, and then we like to have a little all-in-one, which is a little digestive enzyme that has a little bit of betaine HCL in it. So some stomach acid. You know, if the last year hasn't taught us anything, you know, chronic stress can kind of become so normalized in our life that we live with it and we aren't paying attention. And chronic stress depre- uh, depletes our ability to digest food. So we have to address that piece of it. Um We also have to recognize that, again, low estrogen depletes our ability to digest food and then that just age simply. So support it with, you know, bitter sprays are great ones. Spray some bitters, um, digestive bitters on your tongue. Get those gastric juices sort of flowing before you sit down to that meal. And that would be the other caveat. Sit down to your meal, please. Do not be standing up eating from the island. Do not be, you know, at the dinner table frustrated and stressed at a partner or a child or a work situation. You know, prepare your mindset for a meal. Maria and I talk about this all the time. We look at our grandparents. They would come to the dinner with like a a little cup of aperitif. They'd say grace or they'd smile and look at all their grandchildren. But they put themselves in that rest to digest mode. Women do not do that enough. We come and we're like, we just made the meal. Now we're going to eat the meal and we got to go to the next thing. Ladies, we need to like chill out and present yourself to that food. Smell it. Put your fork down between bites. You know, really enjoy that meal. It's there to nourish you. Too many women at this age start to think that food's almost a burden, right? And we really want to change that. So a mealtime mindset, some digestive support, you know, a little maybe apple cider vinegar and water before a meal, things like that. There are ways to sort of help your body do that digestion and breakdown. Okay. I want to, I want to make sure that I hit this question because I think this is a big one. Do you think that midlife issues can be addressed with diet alone? I do not think so. I think Kristen feels the same way. <laughs> um, let's put it. I, I I got this question posed to me today, and someone said, "Can you you imply that we can't be truly well without hormone replacement therapy?" And I t- I went like this, and I took a while to respond. I like it, I was like, "Okay, I'm not going to just knee jerk this one. I'm going to just let, let let this settle in. I know what my thoughts are. It was a discussion on social media. This is a very nuanced question, so it is difficult." But I basically, what came to me is 
it's a bit of a gamble. Um, it's a bit of a gamble. And, you know, I think about my own grandmother lived till 99 years old in what I would say pretty good physical health until the last 10 months of her life. Um, probably had some mood and depression issues for the few years previous. And that's so sad what we think of depression in the elderly is, is common, but the ha- having your hormones on board can, I would say, I don't want to say eliminate, right? Because we're going to age, we're all going to die. You know, let's, let's be real, but we can greatly mitigate these issues as we age. A diet is critical and nobody gets to skip over that. But um, hormones are also extremely critical. And what I feel is I feel we've put so much risk on hormone replacement therapy. I don't want to do that. I want to go all natural. I want to go. I was like, I was, I want to go all natural is how I wanted to be like when I was, you know, mid 40s, you know, 45, 46, 47. I'm really, I'm really deep into perimenopause now. I'm not going to do hormones because. I've got the lifestyle and I've got the food dialed in. Like I'm going to do this. And boy, it wasn't not, but for a year or two later, I was like, Oh hell no. (laughs) That's when I started to research. And when I researched, I was like, okay, so maybe there is some risk to hormones, but that's debatable. And again, that's a nuanced conversation. We actually think there's more risk to aging without hormone therapy for most women. Okay. So it's not a blanket recommendation for all, but for most women. And we don't think about that. We don't. Yeah. We don't ever think about the risks of avoidance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think what, so true. Women, what women don't get is they want to say, I'm going to take an ancestral approach to my health. Well, that's great. Then you should die by about 55 years old because that's <laughs> what the ancestral health is to women's health. And that's just an uncomfortable truth, but we need to be honest that we're living in now a third of our life in menopause. And, you know, Maria's grandmother at 99, she didn't have the same toxins exposure, metabolic Mm -hmm. derangement from processed foods. You know, we are not the same as our grandparents, even if they were flying healthy into late elderly age, because we've kind of screwed it up a little bit more than they have with the things that we've eaten and drank and been exposed to. So we don't have the same kind of paradigm coming into old age as maybe a grandmother who looked like she did great through 99. And the other piece is, while we have these levers to pull for sleep and diet and movement, um, those protect certain things. They can't protect the, you know, brain cognition changes necessarily from hormonal decline. They can't change the cardiovascular, you know, changes in the endothelium of the heart because of of estrogen decline. So we want women to understand it's your responsibility to pull the diet lever, right? And the exercise lever. Um, But don't fool yourself that that's the complete picture. There's another piece to the puzzle. And as long as you know what the risks are of going without hormone sufficiency into your old age, then you do you. But we just want to make sure that women know, you know, what those things are and that it's not based on kind of fear and bad science and things like that. Fantastic. So as we wrap up, I'd love to come full circle. So I always ask this, if you've listened to the show, you're already on to me. But in regard to plant protein in the kind of versus maybe animal protein and pros, cons, benefits, disadvantages. Is there a question that I should have asked that I didn't? Something you think we didn't cover, we could. Um, I mean, I, think- I have something. If Kristen yeah, wants to be, I, I can ask it. Or <laughs> Kristen can answer it though. I'm um, just, the, <laughs> or maybe touch on it. I don't know. I, I just put you on the spot, Kristen. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the whole, uh, planetary kind of carbon footprint, you know, uh, issue it's, it's probably a whole podcast in and of itself, but yeah, I mean, we can take it really quick. It's, you know, essentially we hear multiple things, right? A, I don't like animals because they don't make me feel good. So we've talked about the digestion piece. Um, then we get the, well, but I love the planet and we would say great because animals are actually a carbon sink. Um, they will help turn our emissions and things into usable fuels and, you know, reduce the emissions that we have from our cars and our factories and all of these good things. Cow farts are not ruining the world. um, And there's some great science on that. 
Um, but also that then they say, well, I love animals. And if anyone's followed us long enough, they know I'm a crazy dog mom. I've got a big old 80 pounder sitting behind me right here. Um, I love animals more than anything. Maria loves her horses. You know, we're all for um, preventing animal cruelty. But what we have to recognize is that a plant-based diet is not bloodless. Um, you know, killing one cow to feed multiple families is uh, much different than the amount of animals that are killed in monocropping um, and prevent, you know, producing soy and soybeans and all of these things. So, you know, we just want women to step back and maybe open up um, to the idea that there are some downsides to a plant-based uh, nutrition template. And, you know, maybe the agenda of big food, driving impossible meats and things like that have sort of clouded the issue a little bit. So, um we would say that. And, and, you know, I would take it another step further and say plant-based based diets. One of the biggest things, and you opened with this, was animal protein being bad for our cardiovascular health. And what we've learned now is cardiovascular health is driven by inflammation. It's not driven by the presence of fat and cholesterol. And animal proteins are not inflammatory. Plant proteins, I hate to break it to women, are. Um, they also oxidize our LDL, which is the thing that lays down the plaque and creates the, you know, blockages and whatnot. So, you know, I think there's just a lot to explore. We've had some wonderful people in the health uh, space, holistic health space, put their careers on the line to sort of just change the discussion a little bit. Um, movies like Sacred Cow, which is also a book, um, Brian Sanders of Sapiens coming out with Food Lies. You know, there's just some wonderful ways that if your plant-based diet doesn't seem to be working for you, maybe you need to start asking why. Such a good way to finish. All right, ladies, I'm going to potentially pose questions to our audience as we wrap up with a promise from you that if we get lots of questions that you'll come back. Absolutely. We would love to. Okay. So for now, where can listeners find more Kristen and Maria? So we're active on Instagram and we like to think we're education forward. Um, if they just type in wise and well into the search bar, they should find us. Our picture will both of, of both of us will pop right up. So super. All right. Listeners, now it's up to you. There were a few topics that we did not touch on that we probably could come back and talk all about. Soy, for instance. So we could talk about plant-based meaning to you, potentially simply that you're cutting out meat, not necessarily that you're paying attention to your protein intake. We could talk about how it might force you, if you were plant-based, to eat the same foods over and over that you could be sensitive to and could be causing more problems. But I want to know, what are your questions? So you can leave them below the show notes at flipping50.com forward slash wise and well. What else would I say today? So thanks so much for being here to both of you listeners. It's now up to you. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. 